It is widely recognized that an advanced technology is one of the most distinctive aspects of American society. The historic American engineering record, a program of the National Park Service, documents historic, engineering, and industrial works throughout the country. Measured drawings, photographs, and historical reports are preserved in the Library of Congress for sites and structures which illustrate America's technological development. Documentary films of surviving industrial processes provide still another means of increasing our understanding since they preserve the critical relationship between machines and those who use them. This film is part of the engineering records program for the formation of a visual archive of American technological history. Seneca Glass Company was founded in 1891. Actually, uh, a group of uh, German immigrants living in the Cumberland, Maryland area uh, formed a company. So they had to have a glass factory, a glass house, and there was a baker one in Seneca County, Ohio. So with the West Virginia Charter in 1891, uh, the Seneca Glass Company started in Seneca County, Ohio. Uh, in 1896, the natural gas was discovered in the Morgantown area, and so the Seneca Glass Company moved to its present location in Morgantown in 1896. We were at one time, of course, quite a bit larger than we are today. Uh, we had 20-some shops working, whereas today we have uh, 11. We had 60-some uh, cutters, whereas today we have about 12. Of course, back in the turn of the century, in 1910 and 15, there were no machines to make glassware. Any glass you drank out of was handmade somewhere. Basic raw materials in our batch are silica sand, soda ash, potash, red lead, nitre, and a host of small uh, chemicals uh, for coloring and for what have you. We prepare approximately 2,000 pounds of batch for each pot. In mixing the batch, we, of course, uh, weigh out into a batch card sheet. 200 pounds of this or 50 pounds of that. And we have, and we have all the raw materials weighed out into the batch card. We then use an overhead vacuum where we suck up all the batch into this holding tank. When this is done, we reverse the process, putting the hose into our mixer, and then release all the raw materials as our mixer is moving so that all the raw materials are thoroughly mixed and broken up and go into the mixer. Of course, at this point, then, the mixer is sealed, and there's so many turns on so many, on different batches, and it's thoroughly mixed, and then uh, upended into that same batch cart to be wheeled out and put into the furnace. Oh, we have a different, uh, different formula for every batch we make. Even the collards is different. Like, uh, you might think you could take a crystal batch and put any collar into it, but it's, any substance that goes into this batch has to do with the collar. You know, what it turns out in the nature of the glass, how it works, how it gathers, how it behaves even when you temper it. Going through the layer, right? we had a, like a yellow that we had to keep changing the batch because the temper wasn't right on it. When you go to temper, it would explode. It'd crack. Anything you put in it, it's, it's all important. The cone is added to the batch uh, actually for two reasons. One reason being that we can remelt the glass and again use it. But secondly, it acts as a catalyst in the melting process. After we work a, a, a pot out, at the end of the day, the furnace men manage they're going to fill the pot in for two days uh, later working. 
will leave a four to five inch heel of glass. So if there's seven or eight inches of glass left, they'll ladle out down to the four inch level. The uh, glass that's ladled out of the pot is either dumped or sold to a marble manufacturer. We have a marble manufacturer in West Virginia which buys X amount of tons a month from us of any color to make marbles. It doesn't matter the quality of the glass. batch along with the cullet and of course shovel it into a pot. It's called charging a pot. Uh, and it's shoveled in and the pot is sealed up with a stopper and allowed to cook about approximately 30 hours. Some colors, so to speak, come around faster than others, maybe 28 hours or maybe 32 hours. He puts a rod in there. He sticks a rod right down into the glass and pulls it out. Then you hold it up like that and you'll see little bubbles in there, see? Well, if there's bubbles in there, that's not quite cooked enough. So you put that back in, let it cook some more, and then later on you take another fruit, and you can see if your glass is clear enough, see? We use apple wood on the end of a steel rod and do what we call boiling the glass, and actually churn it up, so to speak, to get the glass is cooking on the bottom up to the top and vice versa. The gatherer certainly has a uh, very important job because once he gathers a piece of glass, that is it. And if he gathers the, the wrong amount, whether it be too much or too little, then the whole item will end up wrong, even though it is the, the right shape. The first piece or two will be broken on the shop to check the weight, to look and see how thick the walls are. I would say blowing. I would say that's the hardest to learn. And uh, you might learn to do it real quick, and maybe the other fellow will never learn it. You just bring it up slow. And as it fills up, it'll just turn harder all the time. You can tell right away when, when it's clear. If you blow too hard, there'll just be streaks all over. It's what they call mole mark. When I was learning my trade, I worked in the blowing room, and when I quit, I could uh, blow, I could gather, and I could still go out there and probably gather glass. I couldn't blow and I couldn't pull stems because I don't have the knack of doing it. We've had boys to come in here and look at this and say, oh, I can never do that. It's because they don't want to try to do it. So when I started to work here, I was making uh, $2.60 a day. and for nine hours. <laughs> at that time, you'd be surprised you had to take your turn. You was only allowed to go ahead and practice maybe a half hour a week. And we couldn't wait till the weekend till that time come, which was on Saturday morning. They'd let us go ahead and practice for a half hour. You go out there and you see those kids carrying in and that. They don't even want to go in there and learn to blow glass. Normally on a stem shop, they're working four out, which is there's four pieces of glass on that shop at one time, in some phase. The governor has one, the blower is putting the stem on one. They are putting the foot on one, they're carrying one away. One person on that shop can throw it out of line. If everybody does their job, you just work even. And you don't work hard. Now, our iron mold, you don't have to cool. We don't put that in water. You don't turn that. You just put it in there and blow. We have uh, two different types of shops. We have a stem shop and a tumbler shop. Actually, a tumbler shop consists of four people, which would be the gatherer, which would gather the glass out of the furnace, the blower, 
if you blow the glass into the mold to shape it, the cracking off person, this would crack the glass off of the pipe after it's manufactured. And the carrying in person, which would carry it from the shop into a tempering layer. So four people. On a stem shop, since we have a stem and foot, we would have six people. Some jobs are more difficult to blow than others. Now, we've got blowers out here that I can't give every job to. I've got to give him something that he can make. Some more difficult jobs, i got special guys to give that to. They can't all do the same thing. would be the boss of the shop, but the weather's tempo would determine how many pieces were going to be made in our period. I made it in the neighborhood of 3,000 moles since I've been here. Most of those, uh, well, maybe in the neighborhood of 50% uh, of them, we had to make patterns for them. So you start out from scratch, you get your wood, you go ahead and turn out your wooden pattern, you put your hinges on it, get it ready to take to the foundry, and when it comes back, it's, it comes back in metal, and then we've got to finish it. The mold, uh, it just lasts forever. If it was left to just cool to room temperature by itself, it would cool in five minutes or so, and undoubtedly blow up or break because of the manufacturing strains in this glass, because the handling of it and the tools against it, what have you. So it goes into an annealing layer, which actually is a conveyor belt inside of an oven, temperature starting at 900 degrees and gradually cooling as it goes back. Our layer runs three hours. It moves about three and a half inches a minute. And so we're coming down. We have a controlled cooling coming down from 900 degrees to room temperature so that we've taken the strain out of the glass. In a glass house, every person's secondary job is inspector. Uh, if there's something wrong with the item, throw it away. Because the faster we throw it away, the less money we put into a bad piece that will be thrown away eventually. Every item we manufacture has a top on it. This is the part that's against the pipe. So we then must, as we call it, crack off the top to the right height. We do this by putting a score, a little scratch, on the item at the desired height. And it spins around on a pedestal with a little jets of flame hitting the item. And as the item spins around, it's heated at the one point where the scratch is. And when it spins long enough, depending on the thickness of the glass, the top actually pops off where it breaks, it cracks all the way around, breaks right where the fire has hit it. So then we just drop the top off and go with the next one. We've had people watch the operation in the hot metal department for 10 minutes and say, well, do you manufacture anything beside bases? After we cut the top off and smooth the top, we must then round off or glaze the top. We put the items on a, as we call it, a glazing machine, which it sits on a pod which spins, and we fire polish the rim of the glass, actually melting over the top, controlled melting, to put the round edge on the glass. Well, this puts the round edge on the glass, but it also 
reheats the top and takes the temperament out of the top of the glass. So it coming off the glazer must be put into a re-annealing layer for another three hour, three and a half hour process. And if we didn't, the top would be very brittle and possibly in the washing it would just ring right off. Well, I have been working. I started about uh, around 32 years ago working here. It takes a lot of time, a lot of patience, and you have to have really some talent to do this kind of work. You have to get accuracy and speed too, to, you know, to keep up and keep your patterns marked up and keep the cutters all in work. We have a sample of every cut pattern, whether it be the goblet or the sherbet or the wine or the cordial or the tea. So we bring the sample out and adjust some rods which actually block out the pattern, not design it out, but block out, space it out. And we set up the, the spacing rods with the sample that's already cut. Take it away and then we mark each piece just for spacing. So the cutter knows a certain portion of the pattern goes below the line, a certain portion goes above the line, or a certain portion goes in between the lines. The uh, marking is done uh, with a red lead paint so that it won't come off with water because there's always water on the wheel and on the glass and we'll end up with this elaborate cut halfway through with the guidelines marked off. When I first came here and started to work, uh, we had uh, quite a few more patterns and blanks, but now we don't have quite as, quite as many to remember. Now, these stones they come from up in the northern part of Ohio. They bring them in and we have to lead the stone, line it up, and then we uh, shape the stone to fit the, the glass. From the time we bring a new stone in and lead it up and uh, shape it, it takes around five, six hours. Sometimes uh, we have to change the stone often for different types of glass. Uh, it uses the stone up faster. After you have the stone shaped and everything, it isn't too much of a job to cut the glass. It, it takes a long time to learn that. Uh, I've been at it quite a few years. I've, I've been here 28 years. I've had several to try to learn it. that worked maybe four or five years, and then they'd give it up. they just find something better. When I started in the glass factory, you just about had to take any job you found, regardless of what it was. Something that uh, I wouldn't advise a young fellow nowadays to get into. Of course, I got a boy he's coming up. I, I wouldn't want to see him come in and learn my trade. Uh, there are things better for him to learn than cutting glass. You uh, take a look at a uh, pattern. And you just about know exactly what stone to pick up to put on to make that, that tight cut. Of course, if you don't know that, well, you're not no glass cutter. But it's just like an artist. He knows what paints to use to make a different color. We use a cork wheel for polish the blemishes that are for the manufacturer. Stems, we generally polish them on a natural core. Well, I presume, I don't know, but I presume we're probably the only ones left today that make up our own corks. And all that, we use a combination of rotten stone and pumice stone as a mud base to polish it. The cork polishing is 
It's very effective and it's very brilliant. Uh, and wherever you could use it, that's what we do. Some of the patterns we have, we have to acid polish it because you cannot get down to those real small cuts. Any man tells you he, he can cut anything, well, you're looking at a lot of it. But there isn't a man alive that can cut anything. In two years, you can learn how to cut mighty, but you spend the rest of your life and still never be a floral cutter. It's more demanding. It takes an entirely deep concentration at all times. You can't be under any pressure. As you notice, there's nobody walking around. There's nobody leaning over your shoulder. They leave you alone. You know your job, and you go ahead and do it. The shame is not any more of us than what they are, but most of them are died off. There is a personal satisfaction that you get that you achieve something. But uh, after a day's work, you're tired like anybody else. And you're ready to go home. The red lead paint will not come off with water. And that's why we use red lead paint, so that in the cutting process, we're not erasing our, our guidelines. So it's a banana, oil, and water solution that uh, is used at the end where it's washed and uh, white. It smells like a fruit market in summer. There's really no perfect piece of glass, just like there's no perfect diamond. But I think Seneca has the most perfect piece of glass as you will find any place.